Good morning, everybody. My name's Don Wysocki. I'm extension soil scientist with uh, Oregon State University at Pendleton. And I am to moderate this breakout. And this is the intermediate rainfall production uh, breakout session. Um, we have two gentlemen today that are going to speak to you about canola production. Uh, first is uh, Tom Chamberlain. He's with Prime Land Co-op. Uh, if you look in your program, uh, there's a pedigree for him there. I'm not going to read this because, you know, one of the, uh, the reasons that you're here is you can all read, I hope. so. Uh, and the second one is Bo Blanchley. Uh, he's with Cropland by Winfield. And what I've understood is they're going to kind of tag team this. Um, if you have a question, um, it's fine to ask questions. Uh, this is being videotaped, so I don't want any uh, outrageous outbursts like the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, and if you ask a question, uh, the speaker's probably going to repeat it because this is the recording mic. So. Um, ask your question and the, the speaker will probably repeat it just so it, it gets into the to the mic. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to these uh, two gentlemen and we're going to learn something about uh, canola. Thank you for being here. Well, welcome. Thanks everybody for coming. Is there anybody here from up at Bonners Ferry? There's a hand back there. Can you ex have you seen this? Yeah. How do they harvest that underneath those trellis wires? <laughs> I'm just wondering if they could actually fit a combine underneath them or what they had to do there. Okay. So I just wanted to ask that question because if you look, they planted this in a hops field and they left all the poles and wires in there. So. It looked like the wires are way too short for a combine, so maybe they did a 55 without a cab or something. So, okay. so one of the things we're looking at is oilseed crops as an alternate or maybe not just a different way to use that same acre. So if you look at some of the things you need, you still need the combine, you still need the drill, and most every drill and combine can do the same thing. But for as part of your combine, it might take an extra couple of rolls of duct tape to seal them in little holes. Because you'd be amazed at what canola can run out of if you haven't cut a canola crop with it. So I'd assume that most of the people in this room or maybe a fair number maybe a fair number of the people that are in this room are in a pretty low rainfall zone where it's been a wheat fallow, wheat fallow, wheat fallow rotation for 40, 50, 60, 70 years and Problem with that is you end up with uh, wheat fallow rye, wheat fallow goat grass, things such as that. So the first part of this presentation that Tom and I put together, we're going to go through a little bit of the basics of growing winter canola and some of the benefits. And like Tom said, do you have the equipment to grow this? Do you have a combine? Do you have a set of drills? It's just almost that easy. You got to figure out how to set both those pieces of equipment up. But other than that, it's not a bad game. Um, talking about the, the super dry area, you take that Okanagan area up around Mansfield, Waterville, up in that central portion of Washington where it has been wheat fallow rye for several years. What my experience has been since I came on board with Winfield is back in 2011, there were about 50 bags of canola that were sold up there as far as the Roundup Ready winter canola. And what the net result of that was was the guys that had seeded it the first year that people started playing with this up there, they came into 2012, so I guess that would have been 2010 sales. Um, they went into 2012, and the guys that had rotated in the, the winter canola, then followed, and then gone back into winter wheat, they were looking around 70 bushels where they had a good rainfall year, and some of their neighbors were still in their 35 to 40 bushel range. Uh, they had the rainfall, but they had the disease and they had the grassy weed pressures that uh, just didn't support the extra bushels. So you can see that a few guys jumped right on board with this and they figured out that they can, even in their super low rainfall area, they can rotate in a different crop 
and start to make their wheat come out. And that's, that's what most of the point of this is in, in my stance is cleaning up the farm and allowing all crops to be able to be grown out there cleaner and more effectively. Why the growth? Why the growth in all this? The rotational value. Hard thing to do. Back when canola first came out and, uh, well, when canola was introduced into our area back in uh, about 88, 89, 90, somewhere in that time frame, did it pencil out that first year? For a lot of people, it didn't. Um, that was a different time with different types of varieties. I would like to say that those first varieties that came out were similar to a weed. You put it out there and 10, 15 years later, you still saw some out in the ditches. Things have changed. Um, those were super high oil content varieties and the yield probably wasn't there and the price definitely wasn't there. So just a quick comparison that Tom and I put together last night showing some of the a, a yield comparison and, and a pencil out, 65 bushel wheat versus 2,200 pound canola. This is based off of more current uh, economics. These, this budget sheet is going to be pretty hard for you guys in the back to see, but we were using 17 cent uh, canola and we were using $6 wheat and went through the range of inputs for both crops. And both crops put out there, the, the canola inputs, we came up with $157.23 total cropping input, and the wheat was $196.83. So right there, we've got about a, uh, well, not quite a $40 advantage on the input levels with the canola, even though the seed is super expensive. And then when you come out and you compare that at 65 bushel wheat at six bucks versus uh, 2,200 pounds at 17 cents, you're looking at uh, the wheat had a little bit higher gross, but if you remember that input page, it's probably pretty close to a wash. And then the next thing down the road is the uh, rotational benefit. So like rotate, Rotating your chemistries is another thing you can do because how many times do we try to go after cheat grass in that low rainfall area which is probably one of your number one weeds and you go with Power Flex, you go with Osprey, Olympus Flex, you're staying in that same chemistry and every year it seems like the cheat grass gets tougher and tougher. Or if you got something like, uh, oh, the other kind of brome that looks a lot like cheat grass. The name eluded me all of a sudden. Rip gut, you know, you can't control that with, sometimes Powerflex works okay on it, but Osprey, you have a lot of failure with it. So by using the winter canola allows you to spray Roundup out there, kill that with a different mode of action. Yeah, you've been using that mode of action on your fallow as well, but it does help control it one more year. So if you look at the GMO, this is Bo's baby here. My question is, and to re repeat this, is, but what was your strategy there for the 65 and the 2200 pounds? How did you arrive at those yield levels? That's just uh, based, what was the strategy you, you of, of the yes, what was the strategy of arriving at 65 bushel wheat versus 2200 pound canola? And the strategy for that was uh, guys in the 65 bushel wheat zone can typically grow 2200 pounds, or guys that were growing 2200 pound winter canola. Their winter wheat average, if they had fairly clean ground, was around 65. So that's kind of where the crossover was. It wasn't based on a, an economic crossover to make the numbers work. Um, if you were to do something like that, you took the prices we had a year ago. Shoot, uh, I sold canola and netted uh, 29.8 cents per pound off of my farm um, in 2012. And so your crossover, you wouldn't have to grow very much wheat, or you'd have to grow a lot of wheat to beat that, but this was basically a crossover with uh, what that type of economic zone should grow with. Using, using current prices net of off coast, so you know the wheat's not $6 right now, but it nets down to fairly close to that. Right, and, and canola isn't quite 17 right now, but it's in that range. I keep being told it's gonna go up. We'll see what happens. Um, my we, have, we have another question back okay. here. Okay. similar question would be, how about yield potential on the upside when we move into a 90 bushel zone then what are you going to get? Well, I've got another slide that doesn't quite address that, but you take the guys up on the Camas Prairie that are growing winter canola. And when canola came out and the first canola varieties didn't seem to yield real well, the guys up on the Camas Prairie threw them in the ditch and went back to growing rape because they'd been successfully growing rape up there for several years. Um, when the canola varieties started getting a little bit better, they started moving some of those rape acres out into canola. And there are guys out there in their winter canola ground that are growing 3,500, 4,000 plus pound winter canola up in the higher elevations, better rainfall. And so that's not uncommon at all. I know I saw some, uh, I think I saw some 
plots. I can't remember whose they were, but there was some plot data in, uh, might have been U of I's data. Was it U of I's data where you guys had a couple of winter canola varieties in Moscow that were around 6,000 pounds? That's pretty cool. That smokes wheat, especially if you get that 30 cent level again, that'd be nice. Um, so that's, that's some of the comparisons we've got. Uh, one of my little pieces, I am the cropland rep. That doesn't mean it's all GMO or, or no-go for me, but uh, some of the pros and cons. Pro for the uh, non-GMO is typically the oil crusher. If they've got a market for non-GMO oil, there might be a penny a pound premium that you've got. Um, another, another potential uh, plus on the non-GMO as far as winter canolas go is typically I think it'd be pretty fair to say that if you take a clean field with a clean production history, put uh, like an Amanda Athena, something like that, or a Baldor, Baldor out there on a clean field and compare it with one of our with the, one of the Roundup Readies, probably in that clean field setting, the, uh, the non-GMO is going to win because of the genetic potential as to where our levels are right now. Now, pro for the GMO, easy to make a clean field. A lot of guys that are putting in canola, I'd say most of the people that are putting in the canola, they're not going for super duper yield. They're going for cleaning up their farm. And so if you've got an easy, effective way to clean up your farm and maybe take just a little bit of a yield hit versus a clean field, it's a way to go. If you take a dirty field and split it with a non-GMO and then also a GMO where you can easily kill the weeds, you're going to be looking at similar yields. You're not going to have that yield advance in, in my opinion and my experience. Um, I had another powerful point to that, and I just cannot remember it. Shoot. Oh, I guess what I'd say is if I had a dirty field and I was thinking about getting out of wheat and uh, growing something else, I would probably go with the GMO. I wouldn't go with the non-GMO. Just in my mind, because if you, you start damaging the, uh, the plants that you're trying to kill, you can only take out the grassy weeds, basically. If you're only damaging them, and then you're still having seed production off of them, you still end up with dirty field going into the future. If I was going to do something and grow a dirty field, I'd probably grow lentils. You know, another crop that it's hard to control things in. But in a clean field comparison, um, these non-GMOs, they are dynamite. They will, they will yield right up there. And we're not quite there on our genetics in a perfectly clean field situation yet. One thing to think about is a lot of these dirty fields are fields like that have... Uh, goat grass in them and what have we been using typically to control goat grass would be your beyond type herbicides and that really does affect your rotation back to canola so keep that in mind so if you're going to plant something like that you remember the old pursuit days where if you had it in the ground you needed to stay out of canola production for seven to eight years you know it's not quite that long with the clear field technology but you need to if you're going to rotate into canola right away you need to go with the clear field type canola which is another Another system that's available. Okay, and just to show a couple of the offerings that are out there, if you do look at a, at a GMO setup, the GMO, it's not all bad. If you've been working with the Group 2s, your Maverick, your Olympus, things such as that, and that is limiting your options, you can't go out there with the non-GMO. Um, we offer uh, Roundup Ready that also has SU residue tolerance. So that's available out there. That's non-hybridized. And then if you just want to have a Roundup Ready that's got a really good yield, we've got the hybridized uh, without the SE residue tolerance. So that takes away some of those plant back restrictions. You still have some limitations going chasing uh, imidazolone chemistry. Um, one of my keepers is in the back of the room. I don't know if I want to go too brave on saying this, but we've seen that uh, even though our SE residue tolerance is not labeled for that, we do seem to see maybe a little bit of shortening as far as the time frame that needs to come back going into canola if it's SU residue tolerant because of the cross tolerance that we run across. Okay, and, and one thing that our company is doing to try and address the difference as far as if you end up with perfectly clean fields and potentially a difference in the yield is we have a new variety that we're hoping to get licensed here in the next couple of years and it's showing a 300 to 500 pound yield advantage to anything else that we've played with. So we are catching up. Any other questions? Any other questions so far, Doug? In some of these real dry areas, um, have you been able to count on a technology across the country besides B2? Yeah, the group. Uh, yeah, Maverick Olympus finesse, uh, no problem whatsoever. The question was, 
can we count on that CERT, uh, that CERT technology to take care of the sulfonic urea tolerance? And yes, we can. It's not a problem. And so, no, that's, that's really uh, increasing the amount of acres that are available. So even if you got some of them like Ally, which is a real long residual, I've seen Ally put on winter wheat, but then most of the low rainfall country, you're going a summer follow year. So, you know, you're spraying your winter wheat, then you're going to harvest, it's going through the winter, and then you're planting the winter canola the next year. And that's where the winter canola is typically worked out better in the low rainfall because you, you can plant on that summer follow year and not lose a year of production because you're not used to annual cropping and everything. But with Ally placed on those fields, I have not seen any damage to it at all. Okay. Uh, another thing to talk about in the winter canola uh, stand establishment that can be a little bit of a problem if it's super hot outside. But one thing that uh, one thing that people don't address a lot, and we're in a no-till conference here, is high leg. If you go out there and you seed that crop, we'll show a couple other uh, pictures. High leg is when you go out and you're seeding into the crop, and you're not set up to have some kind of a residue management to where your seed is dropping down, and you end up just basically stuffing the seed down into the residue, and you haven't cleared it off the side. One thing that can affect one thing that can affect the uh, winter tolerance. So your residue was your residue was all the way up here, so that's where your crown formed. So that's why you got this really long stem here. Right, and that's, uh, that does increase your exposure. So when you're selecting your drill to do your, your winter canola that you're seeding early in the, in the summer, late summer, if it all possible, if you can move that residue to the side as you drop the seed, you've probably got a better chance of uh, not having the high leg problem and exposing that crown. You can see a little bit of winter kill. This is pretty small canola to try and go through the winter anyways. You know, uh, dinner plate. Dinner plate is perfect. That comes up, uh, he asks, what size do you want to have to go into winter? That's a sketchy game. You play the game of uh, when can I seed that canola and get that stuff in the ground, get it into moisture and make it come up. Worst thing you could do is dust it in and think, man, it's going to rain someday because it isn't going to. Uh, the dinner plate theory if you can get that plant up to about the dinner plate, just say eight to 10 inches is about what I'd round that up to. If you can get it that big, what you're doing is you're creating enough of a taproot to go down into the ground and store energy to move through the winter. You go through and you see some of these fields and some of these doggone fields, there's two foot across canola out there and a lot of robust growth that's occurred. Um, they're gonna be okay going into winter. They've got plenty of taproot reserve to survive this. If you go out there and you try and seed uh, the 1st of September, unless you have a tremendous amount of open weather, you're going to end up with a plant that's about four inches across. And you might look at it uh, the end of December and, boy, I think we're still good. You show up out there the middle of March and look at it and you're trying to find your plants and it looks like Mexico. It's gone. It's not coming back. So then you find yourself in that delicate balance of how early do I seed? How late can I seed? I don't want to put this in right now. I don't want to pull all, all my moisture out. A lot of guys down in Oregon, I know we're close to there. There's guys that are seeding, uh, say, the end of June, middle of June. Um, it's a little early for my comfort. Ideally, uh, if you're going to have to seed real early, I'd, I'd, stand, I'd stand strong and say don't put fertilizer down when you seed that that early because if you put fertilizer down, you're encouraging two things. You're encouraging, one, the crop is going to take that fertilizer in and make a bushy growth. Two, the bigger that plant is, the more moisture you're going to draw out of the soil, and when winter comes and that thing desiccates off completely, all the nutrients that were pulled up into those leaves and all the water that was burned to that point, you're done. The plant has to regenerate, and so a lot of that has been wasted. So what I've seen has been pretty effective is uh, late fall fertilizing, very early spring fertilizing, things such as that to split it up, not putting it down right away. A little better picture of a stand here. If you look at this though, a lot of people think this was really sparsely seeded. And it, it was actually seeded heavy, but it didn't all come up. It was seeded just a little bit late and it didn't get down to good moisture. So that's one thing to think about is when you're seeding this, typically we, in the past on spring canola and still currently, you don't want to seed it too, over, too deep into the soil because it won't have enough vigor to come out up. But when you get into those warm soils and you get it down to moisture, 
it'll come from inch and three quarters to over two inches deep and come up. And so you're better to seed that in the summertime way deep and, get, and then get it to come up out of the ground than to seed it shallow and not get it to moisture. Right, it'll act very similar to wheat as far as the vigor thing goes. Um, seeding wheat early in the spring, shallow is better because if you stick her in there too deep, you're not going to have enough energy to push that plant out. Same thing later on in the spring, if you get a little bit later with your canola or wheat seeding, you can stick it in a little bit deeper. I had a situation on my own farm uh, last spring where I'd gotten out there a little bit hasty. It was in my 12 inch rainfall for spring canola. And of course we didn't get 12 inches last year, it's kind of the pits, but I went out there and I seeded super early, got the plants in, got them to pop out of the ground. You saw those pictures with the high leg back there and all that residue. Canola is not going to like it if you're stuffing the seed into residue. It can handle the residue around it, but if that seed itself is pinned in with mostly residue as opposed to soil, it's weaker. We had a weather event in the middle or end of April. And where my canola was in super early, it was up. And I had a fair amount of that piece that frosted out that it got nuked. And then the piece right next to it that I'd seeded two weeks later had no trouble coming through because it was just popping out of the ground when the frost came. It wasn't in the, it was seeded a little bit better, not into that residue. But to the point of the seeding depth, I went back to fix the early seeded stuff on May 3rd. And I had a Great Plains 3010 drill set up at 10 inch space. And I socked that guy into the ground about two and a half inches to put that into moisture, and it was 85 degrees outside when I did it. That canola was out of the ground in five days. And that canola, I used a little bit earlier variety than what I primarily had used. It ran and raced and ran and raced and almost caught up with the 950, it was 930, the nine, almost caught up with the 955 when it, by the time it got super hot and blooming was over. And the net result of that was uh, we were only looking about 40 or 50 pounds difference, about 1,425 pounds per acre on the piece that was seeded into versus 1,470-something on the piece that was not seeded into but seeded in a little bit later. So another take-home on this, you know, on the spring canola, is don't get in too awful big of a hurry. Wait until your conditions are right. And same thing in the winter canola. Don't stuff that thing into the dust and assume that it's going to rain. If you think you can feasibly put that stuff into the moisture and get it to take off, it will probably take off. The next slide here is showing row spacing. Is Mike Stubbs in the room? No, he's not here. He's not here. Okay. Mike has done a real good job. He's, he's seeding 34 inches on a lot of his stuff up around Dusty. And uh, he's, he's typically using uh, the Amanda, I think is his lead canola up there. Myself, uh, from what I'm seeing with our varieties, I'm seeing a little bit better response is if you can close those rows up. And uh, I'll talk about response to population on our spring canolas here in a few minutes. But I think that um, row spacing wise, probably seven to 15 inches is probably ideal. Both, probably spring a little bit closer. Yeah, both spring and winter, I'd say that if you can get it narrowed up a little bit, have a little bit stronger stand out there. And in a non-GMO situation, I think this would help. Um, a lot of the reasoning for going with a super wide row spacing is to try and shovel the soil off to the side in a, in a summer seeding situation so you can get down to the moisture without covering the seed up with a tremendous amount of dirt. But if you're set up where you can be a little bit narrower, you end up with a competition advantage. And anytime you've got a competitive crop, You've got uh, less chance of the weeds trying to take over. And the other part about this is if uh, that, that picture a few slides back where you can see quite a few holes in the, uh, in the stand of that winter canola, not only do you worry about having weeds move in, but you end up with these big super monster plants that are out there and they're dry down time from the time when they start getting ripe versus uh, when everything in the field is ripe is quite a bit different. If you can have a nice thick stand out there Everything will dry down uniformly, and you don't end up with plants still with green pods on the bottom and potentially shattered out on top. Um, here's a couple questions on low to intermediate yield. 12-inch farm, I think we were uh, 2,362 pounds, and that was uh, high class 115 Roundup Ready SU residue tolerant. And then on 20-inch farm up on the mountain, it has its own problems, so it's not quite as glamorous as it looks to be in the higher rainfall but it was just a shade under 3,000 pounds. And if I would have sold as soon as I put it in the combine, that would have been 90 bushel wheat in comparison on the pricing. So 
I think it's pretty feasible in low rainfall. This 12 inch farm, it was basically working off the previous year's fallow moisture because we did not get our full 12 inches out there, but the yield was still pretty strong. Um, just another slide kind of showing what's available on the GMOs. You've got uh, Roundup Ready, easy to use Roundup. Liberty Link, it's a different mode of action. It's a little bit weak on grass. And then you've got Clearfield as a, as a non-GMO, and there are also other non-GMOs out there. The Clearfield is, uh, as it states, it's tolerant to the imidazolones. So if it had Beyond on it the previous year, you're good to go to seed this right in. Problem with the Clearfield is uh, you're back to maybe using Beyond for any broadleaves, and there's a lot of broadleaves like Russian thistle that you're not gonna, gonna touch with the Beyond. Um, another point on our company here, uh, just, just to explain, if you're picking genetics, I don't know how everybody else's genetics are lined out when you go through the seed guide, but on ours, on our Roundup Ready line, the first digit being the nine, which means Roundup Ready, the second couple digits, that's the maturity range. We're in the low to intermediate rainfall area in here. Looking at that, it doesn't make a lot of season, it doesn't make a lot of uh, sense to go with a super long um, long maturing variety like a 988. The thing that happens in typically in our low to intermediate rainfall zones is super hot heat in June or July. So in our numbering system you take our newest one 930. Uh, 930 performed really well this year. 930 has a super high heat tolerance and it's early maturing. When I went back in and reseeded on May 3rd or 4th um, I was seeding into standing 955 ground, and I stuck 930 in there simply for the fact that the 930 would take off and grow quicker, and it would mature earlier to make it so that I didn't end up with a hodgepodge out there in the field as far as waiting for things to, to ripen. Up in that Waterville uh, Mansfield area, we had some guys that had some weak stands of Roundup Ready Winter Canola, and we rolled the dice. We had, uh, we had some guys, and they wanted to seed into some things, and I didn't know the 930 was gonna be available yet, so we had a few of those guys put the 955 in, and then magically we ended up showing up with some of the 930, which was super early, and so some of the other guys were able to use the 930. And I've discussed with, with a few of the people that are here at the show today, and they were real happy with that 930 that was seated in around their edges. Um, the maturity on it was not too terribly far behind their 115 winter canola, so they didn't have to wait two weeks to go back into their field, so they are able to patch things up quickly that way. But uh, when you look at the University of Idaho trials, which I shamelessly put a nice poster up over at my display, um, this year our 930 really shined. And I think that a big reason for that is because of that super hot weather that we had in July. I think that shut down most all the other varieties. Um, and talking about the shutdown on the varieties, it used to be 20 years ago when the, uh, when the super hot weather would come, super hot weather was 90 degrees. And at 90 degrees, if you had three days of 90 degree weather, you were done game, set, match over on your, uh, on blooming. Now we've made, there's been a lot of advances and say probably in the last four or five years, um, that super hot temperature at 90 degrees, that's not super hot anymore. The plants respond more to if they still have soil moisture. If they still have soil moisture, even if they get nipped off by high temperature, they will come back and take off and, and start to bloom again or continue with their bloom. Um, one thing that I saw was I've got a little bit of yield trial here in Pomeroy and we shut down at a hundred, we had three days in a row, they were 110, 112 and 111 degrees. We'd had several days of 90 degree weather in the weeks before and that didn't stop the canola from blooming. We got up to 110, we did shut down, but I think most of that was a function of we were finally out of gas in the profile. We didn't end up with the moisture this year that we've had the last couple of years. Another thing to talk about is response to population. How many guys have heard, well, how many pounds of, uh, how many pounds of canola seed should you go out there and seed? Somebody's gonna tell you four, somebody's gonna tell you six. Well, it's not that easy. You take four, four, pound, uh, four pounds per acre, that's about 400,000 plants, versus six pounds per acre. A Couple of different things to consider here. One, you've got the cost of seed. Seed's expensive, but the second thing is, You've got your, uh, your difference in your, your weed control. It's gonna be a lot easier to control weeds. Doesn't matter if it's GMO or non-GMO if you have this kind of competition out there. Next thing, our company's done a lot of work with response to population. These are old numbers with a little bit less, uh, 
a little bit higher canola prices, but typical response, four pounds to six pounds, typically if you're to average the canolas together, you would end up having an economic advantage going, for, going up to six. If you're in a lower rainfall zone, the advantage on the yield is a little bit less. Uh, you see on the right, you're looking at six pound per acre average of 1,629 versus four pounds at 1,521. Not quite as big of a response to population, but you've also got that, uh, you've also got that weed control issue out there. Back to response to population. One thing that our company's done as far as studying these things is just like when you're growing wheat, it, it's been found in corn that different varieties will respond and yield at different populations. And that's something you'll probably see more in wheat research coming down the line. We've got uh, response to population scores on all of our different varieties. And we've got a couple of the decalbs that we've worked with here too. And then also with the Liberty Link line. Um, the lower the number, probably the better number for you as a farmer growing seed is. It's a lower response to population, which means that uh, the more seed you put on, the overall yield is going to be a little bit less dramatic. We take the uh, older varieties, like a 921. That had a response to population of nine, so the long and short of that is, if you went from four pounds to six pounds, you probably had a pretty big yield increase. You look at our newer material, like the high class 930, it has a response to population of three. So the yield doesn't go up tremendously. It's still going to be worth doing, you know, increasing some, but it's not as marked. The invigors have great scores and, and some of the decals have pretty good scores too. So the next time somebody says, uh, how many pounds of canola should I put on per acre? Pretty critical to see what variety you're looking at. Um, anybody in this gr room grow any of the uh, Clearfield Oasis? Okay, a couple of you guys, uh, the response to I would say the response to population on that would probably be about a 12. Um, four pounds of, of oasis isn't enough. Guy should probably be six to nine pounds. And that's gonna be twofold. Back to the whole deal with the crop competition, since you've got limited chemistry to handle it. And two, those plants seem to thrive better when they've got more of their brothers on each elbow. Oh. Yes, sir. Can you comment on um, how seed size plays into choosing your seeding rate? <laughs> oh man, um, the question is, the question is, is how does seed size, how does seed size uh, affect your, your decision on what to plant? And that's pretty loaded. Um, that's, that one's real hard for me because you go through all these different varieties and it depends on what the lot is. A lot of the time you'll end up with discrepancies in the seed size uh, and it is back it is on the bag it is on the bag i think that basically if you're when when we're talking four pound per acre versus six pound per acre we're assuming about a hundred thousand seeds per pound and so some of that could be adjusted based off the seed size um mark torno he's with our company in the back how, how would you address that so one of the, the things that i look at is you do get a little bit higher survivability when you take that bigger seed and, and so your, your natural death loss is a little less. But there's there's only so far that goes because if you go to a, a small seed and you're going to get quite a few plants out there, the bottom line is you can't use the seed size in a direct relationship to say, this is someone put this many seeds out there, I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that many plants because you have Mother Nature in there and that buffer of that soil and what it can handle on, on uh, survivability. So there's buffer. I look at a general rule of thumb is if you have a, a big seed size, go about a pound up. If you have a small seed size, go about a pound down. We're working actually on, on some stuff to try to define that a little bit better, but uh, it, it, it is a little challenging. It, it's on moisture and all those other factors of soil. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, here's some localized yields in Pomeroy. This is at a 20 inch location. We've got the blue bars 2012 and I only, I only compared three of my own because that's what I had. Um, blue bar in 2012, we were at about 1,650 pounds and 955 was our new variety that year and we we're at 2,100 pounds. I didn't have any of the uh, 930 to compare. But looking back at this, uh, the red bar in 2013 where we had that super high heat the 947 was about 2150, and the 930 and the 955 were at uh, 2,404 pounds each. 2,404 and 2,405. So 
20 inch rainfall, uh, non elk pressure area, pretty, pretty obtainable in that 20 inch rainfall zone. 12 inch rainfall zone, we were in the 1400 some odd pounds. So that penciled out okay this year versus barley and the field's clean. Here's some plots that were sent to me by a retailer. I don't know exactly whose farm this was on, but this was in, uh, in the Davenport area. And supporting the statement as far as the early variety that has the heat tolerance winning, the 930 was about 2,100 pounds. Our 955 was, uh, I think, about 1860. And then moving on down the line, the Oasis, a non-GMO, non-hybridized, uh, non was kind of in the middle of the road. So just if you think in this low to mid-rainfall zone, if you think you're going to be looking at uh, high heat situation, low water situations, that's where a, an earlier maturing variety is really going to shine for you. Canola planting, direct seeders out here, that can be tough. Slower down. Quick demonstration here showing if you're trying to plant, trying to plant at two inches at four miles per hour, the little, uh, the little diamonds show your seeding depth. At four miles per hour, you're pretty doggone uniform moving across. This, uh, this isn't even a direct seed slide. I know that with direct seeding, it's even tougher. This is in tillage where the, uh, where the field was seeded, pretty similar to the way that the, uh, the tillage was run. And you move that up to six miles per hour, you start splashing seed up on top of the soil, and you start burying seed. Anybody here grow canola back in the late 80s, early 90s? Any of you guys? Okay. Did you guys use a Valmar? Okay. Well, that used to be one of the... the uh, one of the main practices because everybody was struggling with how are we going to get so few pounds on per acre well let's use a valmar machine and harrow it in problem with you get into a low rainfall situation and we saw it last year even up towards kendrick we had guys that seeded fairly late and they used the valmar which their seeding depth was anywhere from top of the soil to about three-eighths of an inch it didn't rain again so the long and the short of that is unless you're in a mountainous area and you could get it in early to where you know you're going to have plenty of uh, plenty of rains to put it in, seed it with a drill. The technology is out there to set your drill to do it. Canola um, starter fertilizer with the seed. You got to remember you've got a really small seed there, and so it doesn't take much as far as a solid index. Ammonium sulfate's a little bit sketchy, and uh, potassium, very sketchy. Potassium chloride. E even high levels of nitrogen. Watch, watch that putting it with the seed too. Okay. Um, one thing to talk about is uh, I get this call pretty often from the growers is what kind of fertility do I want to run? Well, that's a tough question. My best answer for that is if you know how you do with spring wheat typically, run your nitrogen, take your soil sample, run your nitrogen based off what you would do for spring wheat. We've known for years that uh, spring barley responds very favorable to, to sulfur. Well, Canola is kind of the steroid version of that. As far as sulfur goes, take your soil sample, look and see what you would do as far as sulfur if it was spring barley, and add a few pounds. The second part of soil sampling with sulfur is you look out through a field, and especially a canola field, if you haven't been very proactive with your sulfur, you'll see a lot of low and high areas. You'll see areas that look similar to this canola where it started to bolt and it didn't bush out very well. In my mind, because of the variability out in the field, there are two different types of uh, sulfur soil tests. There are ones that are low, and there are ones that are wrong. Sulfur is very hard to get an accurate test on. So sulfur is a nutrient that I would err on the safe side of maybe over-applying more than what you would typically put on for this crop, just simply because you will probably get some benefit out of it in your subsequent crop. Uh, but primarily is if you've got nitrogen out there and you don't have enough sulfur to balance that out, there's nothing that will, nothing that will diminish the yield of your uh, canola faster than being over on nitrogen, low on sulfur. And you might not see it. These are the obvious sy symptoms when it starts to bolt. And here's another symptom. You see the, uh, the veins of the leaf are real dark green and you're real pale in between. Sulfur deficiency. The good thing about sulfur deficiency is if you do see this out in your field and you know that it's going to rain someday, you can go out there with 50, 60 pounds of 20, 20, 20 00, 24 ammonium sulfate, put it out, and uh, if you do get some rain, it doesn't take very much. The plant will absorb it, take off, and catch right back up. 
Sulfur, if you've got, uh, if it's starting to bolt and looks terrible, you've got a bunch of this out there. If you're proactive, you can salvage that crop, and make it just about as good as it's going to be. What's your preferred sulfur nitrogen rate? Oh shoot! If I was putting on, if I was putting on 100 pounds of, if I was putting on 100 pounds of nitrogen, not probably what we'd be doing here, but just as far as the ratio goes, I'd probably be putting on uh, 24 to maybe 28, 30 pounds of sulfur. So you can figure out your ratio based off of that. Um, I don't know that you could really hurt yourself with the sulfur. I don't think it's very possible to put on too much. And typically, you know, sulfur is a good thing to have in your soil anyways because it helps things break down. Other thing you bring up is on the sulfur is the type of sulfur. Back in the good old days, a lot of co-ops and a lot of non-co-ops, we'd run the red, the red nitrosol, which was elemental. It's a great sulfur if you're growing wheat. Terrible if you're growing canola. Tiger 90 elemental sulfur terrible for canola. You should be looking at a thiosol form or an ammonium sulfate form because of the red being readily available. If you're using one of those slow release forms, uh, you run a real heavy risk of not having the right environmental conditions to have that break down in time to be available for your crop. So you need to put down an ammonium sulfate or thiosol. Another thing just to touch on here is uh, bugs. You got our flea beetles. Most everybody that's putting canola seed out there has a good enough uh, insecticide on it. The flea beetles are typically not a problem. The insecticide that goes out with the seed and the seed treatment will take, the, the plants will handle it. The only time you ever see an, a big infestation, it seems, on uh, seedling canola is if a guy has a test plot of canola in a sea of all other crops to where the flea beetles, they put up the radar and they come on in because they know that there's a very small amount of good meal there for them. So oh, there, there's other places that there's a problem. <laughs> If you plant your spring canola specifically really early, a lot of times that canola yeah. will come up real slow and you'll notice around the edges of the fields, around the grass waterways or other areas like that, or wet areas where the canola is growing real slow that the flea beetles will really attack it. Because they attack all the stuff, all, all the stuff, all the canola out there, but usually you've got good enough growing conditions that they get a taste of it and they don't want, they don't want it based on the seed treatment. But if it grows slow enough, there's enough of them that taste that canola plant that it will cause damage. So that's when you sometimes you'll plant it early April or something like that, and you'll have to go in there and spray a pyrethroid on it to try to control the flea beetles in those early growing conditions. Right, you're right, Tom. If you do put it in there early and it cannot grow fast enough to outgrow the flea beetles, that's a problem. And that's another stand to where as far as if you're trying to figure out in your system when to plant the canola, go plant your spring wheat. Get done with all of your spring wheat. Wait a little bit of time. Uh, plant your canola more at spring barley or at the end of spring barley timing so that you can put it in the ground and it'll take off and grow. That in a nutshell is what we put together on this. Uh, Tom and I'll be available the next couple days or all day tomorrow or all day today and part of tomorrow. What what questions might, might we be able to answer here? Well, Sir. Okay, Roundup Ready Canola in a chem file situation. Well, that's a twofold question, twofold answer. If it's a spring Roundup Ready, not much of a problem. Um, our spring Roundup Readies, they're a hybrid, and so what does fall on the ground and take off and grow? Very weak, very puny. We we'll see this year after year, the, uh, the volunteer springs, if you get enough weather in the, in the fall to get them up and going, they're pretty well nuked out uh, when winter gets going very far at all. On the winter canola, you're thinking this through. We got Roundup Ready. We got SU Residue Tolerance. You know what kind of monster are we trying to put together out there? Well, there are plenty of chemicals that will smoke it. Um, Husky's not one that's typically in your fallow, but that'll smoke it. 2,4-D smokes it. Um, just because it's SU Residue Tolerant, as far as tolerating the SU that's in the soil, doesn't mean that it's going to handle an SU in your chem fallow very well. It's, it's based off the soil activity, and there's a certain level as to what it will take. If you went out there and you put probably, say, a 5X rate of Maverick on a piece of ground and then tried to seed a uh, Roundup Ready SU Residue Tolerant, even though it's SU Residue Tolerant, that would probably be more SU than it could take. Same thing as if you're going over the top of it while it's standing out there, it's getting the direct contact. It's not going to be able to handle that. So, yep. to your neighbors at all. Well, I hate that you asked that. Um, 
I farm up on the mountain, and uh, Pat, have you seen this? Have you seen my reseeding down there on Ledgewoods? I should talk to them about that. That's pretty cool. I, uh, I had a, one truck that only made two, fa- two trips off of the farm. It was basically the one that we kept there as the overflow truck, and I didn't realize it until I took it in and dumped it. When I pulled up on the scale, I had this nice little black pile at the back of the truck, and it was leaking like a sieve. And then late this fall, I saw where I had some... Uh, I had splashed it down the road and had a neighbor that seeded his chem fallow wheat, and of course he inverted his soil a little bit, so he perfectly planted it. Um, in that situation, that canola, I don't know if it, it, the truck made one trip with winter canola and one trip with, with spring canola. So I don't know if it was the winter canola or the spring canola that seeded into the ground there, um, but in either case, what I saw out there was about three or four inch diameter canola, so chances are it's toast. It doesn't matter if it's winter or spring. Um, you know, asking if, if it's moved into other people's crop grounds would be the same thing as you driving down the road and you've got barley on your truck or wheat on your truck. It may show up a little bit, then all of a sudden nature's going to take its course and it's going to be gone. So I don't worry about that too much. Good question. Although you do share, share the same birds with your neighbors and sometimes they will <laughs> pack it around and drop it. Yeah. And it looks kind of cool to have a big canola plant out in the neighbor's field, you know. So. Yeah. And we had another question over here first. Yeah, earlier on you talked about winter canola sitting in early. You said don't feed it nitrogen. Give us your split application process and what kind of equipment would you use for the later applications post emergency. Okay, um, dry fertilizer or stream jets, or even a spoke wheel applicator. I'll seed, uh, I'll seed fairly early, and I won't put anything down. Um, probably a mistake on my super high elevation stuff. I should have put a little bit of phosphate down. Because I've seen some phosphate deficiency, you could put on your phosphate. I went in uh, last year. I did it twice. I split it to late fall and then early spring. The problem with that is when you think it's early spring, it's hard to get in there early enough to really have it be early spring because the winter canola, it's got a big tap root. So if it starts seeing weather where it can take off and grow, it's going to take off and grow. And so you get in there and you're having troubles mudding up your field trying to apply a, a dry or a stream jet application early in the spring. You can't get in there quite early enough. And if you don't have adequate, no, adequate uh, fertilization for that plant, plant's just like a wheat plant. If it's starving when it takes off and t- tries to start growing, it can start to make some of those decisions as to what is going to be my genetic potential. So my answer to that would be a simple dry application Liquefied urea, if you're late enough in the fall and it's cooled or you don't worry about any volatilization, do that with stream jet nozzles. Very easy application going that way. Or Solution 32. Solution 32 is my, uh, my preferred method, and I'll put the Solution 32 on right at the last minute where I think I might be caught in a snowstorm if I wait much longer. And then I know that I've got it applied, and I know we've got enough time for it to be taken in. Hey, wasn't Doug? Yeah, Doug. I have a question for you about what your experiences have been with dry rot. Um, we have great habits with green grid men that are known to crops, less so with our alternative crops, right. even less focused on that with Roundup Ready. So I wonder if you could speak to the, to the uh, crop health side. You know, uh, I can't really single out the rise octonia, but just the simple mathematics of all this is what you're stating as soon as you start breaking that cycle and get out of cereals you start to cut down drastically on the diseases that have been pinning down your wheat for years tom do you have any input on that it it's just it's like rotating any other crop it does seem to help reduce the disease load in in the winter canola going back into winter wheat too because typically if you plant winter wheat back on the canola stubble you will see a five to seven bushel yield increase versus coming off of a no legume product or legume. My, my, my question though was the, the, the yield benefit to the canola could be really not the, not the um, sequential crop. And I've, I've, never, I've never seen that documented or yeah. even looked at. Mark, have you seen anything? I keep throwing my, uh, the harder questions back there to Mark. Mark's our uh, market manager for canola for cropland, so he's a little sharper on this whole thing. Sir. Um, I think Bill Schillinger did some cropping systems at, at Ridgeville, and uh, there, were, there was back-to-back spring canola, and they were picking up Rhizoc in the canola. Okay. Um, but that was back-to-back. 
uh, two consecutive years of, of spring and all. I know Tim Fox, who was a plant pathologist with the USDA at WSU, was one of the first to, to discover that. Uh, but again, it was back to back. Okay, one thing that's being done. Okay. Okay. All right. And okay, he didn't catch your name, but you stated that uh, the research showed that there was nothing as far as an effect on the rhizoctonia, as the rhizoctonia was singled out as a disease. Okay. Um, one thing that we are changing is in the next couple of years, you'll start seeing all the canola that we're putting out there being treated with vibrance. And vibrance addresses rhizoctonia. Doesn't matter what the crop is, it's going to address it. So it, it is something that can happen in canola. Um, probably one of the reasons why you don't see it manifest as well is because uh, when you do put in another crop, if that type of crop hasn't been grown in so long or in such a long time or ever, you end up with a lot of the other pests that typically attack the crop aren't present. And so you take something like rhizoctonia in that first year, it really doesn't attack the plant because it it will be there but there isn't enough of a presence with it based on or in combination with other diseases that are out there to compound the problem. But vibrance is a seed treat that's being added here. Uh, we've got some seed that'll go out with it this year and then probably next year that'll be our standard and that will address the rhizoctonia to help. Yes? So our canola, our canola had canopy and the first of December we were zero degrees with the north wind. So the top is fried. Yep. What do I look for this spring to see if that plant's going to recover? And, and at what point do you sit there and say, we've just got too much damage and we need to go back in there? You know, I don't, I don't really know right now, you know, and we, we're not, the frost is cold. But, uh, okay. So what do, what, do, what do I need to look for as a grower out there to see if those plants Okay, the question is, uh, after the cold events we've had here in the Pacific Northwest where it got down around zero or below with a pretty stiff breeze and all the winter canola is melted off the top, when you go to reevaluate that towards springtime, when do you decide if you're okay or if you've lost your crop? And I would answer that basically is uh, when you start getting into where the crop is starting to grow, everything starts to green up a little bit, just start looking at those plants and see if they've got new green coming out of them. I saw plants last year that uh, you would have sure thought were dead, and we actually declared a few of them dead. And another week later, they started poking out green leaves. Um, what I've seen is if, if it will poke out the green leaves, it will act as if it hadn't been spanked that way. There will be a few plants individually in the field next to them that will die completely but the, the die-off number isn't usually too high. So I wouldn't be too concerned if you start to see green up. Um, you start seeing if uh, you'll see plants that have one or two inches worth of growth greening up in the middle. If you look out there and by the time you've got a couple inches of green growth in the middle, if you're looking around and there's only one plant in five feet, that's when I'd start getting concerned. But uh, some of them will take off a little bit later and so you've got a lot of time. It's way too early. I had a few calls from up way up north after we had that super cold weather. And you're up around Okanagan. We were at your farm last year, weren't we? Right. Okay. And I had some phone calls regarding some of the guys up there, and they're asking, when does the winter canola freeze out? And I just simply asked them, did your winter wheat freeze out? Well, we don't think so. Well, I think the, the winter canola is going to freeze out about 45 minutes before your winter wheat does. So that's, that's what we're seeing. The, the genetics have gotten a lot better than where they were. Don. That. The, the issue about uh, winter damage, uh, one of the things you can do is pull up a plant, cut through the crown, and look at all those little buds. And if that crown and that taproot is white, that, that plant's probably going to be okay. If that crown starts to turn brown or you find any rot in it, then you have an issue. So, you know, that's even before some of this regrowth. Look, look at that crown, take a jackknife, cut through that, that crown, and look at that tap root right at the, at the crown. Go ahead, Tom. So you, you can also see that same thing with deer or elk damage, because sometimes you'll, they'll eat off the leaves and you'll think, man, they really hurt it. I've actually seen them eat the top of the crown off to where you got your tap root, and then there's just the top of the, top of the crown there is completely gone. And as long as, like you're saying, as it stays healthy and white, 
it'll actually branch out one or two like tillers coming off the side of that taproot and it'll regrow. It will hurt with deer and elk damage, it will hurt your yield overall, but there's a lot of times those plants will actually shoot off another, I don't know what you would even call it, Nebraska, but it's like a tiller coming off of a wheat plant It comes off the side there. So don't get concerned about it early because you got a lot of time to worry about it after you find out that it's not growing before you can get in the field to replant it. So I don't, it's like grandpa used to say, go fishing for a couple of weeks and then come back and reevaluate it. So. Right, and I, I've looked at some of those plants. That, that's why I threw out the later diagnosis. I'm gonna get you in just a second, but uh, on, the, on the later diagnosis, if it's green, it's green. I've seen some plants where it is pretty brown and a lot of that white is gone and people are ready to throw in the towel on it. And I looked at some of that in Dayton last year. There were some plants that were seeded real early and they had a lot of necrosis to them and, and they did come back and regenerate. So like Tom said, go fishing, think about it later. You know, that's, that's, it's, there's no sense in stewing. Sir, back there, you've been. Could you go over the planting restrictions following beyond? Planting restrictions following beyond. Okay, beyond is a tough one to throw a blanket recommendation out there, but I bet if you looked at the label, yeah, 26 months. But that's going to have a lot of effect. There's going to be a lot of effect on the pH and then the rainfall. Beyond is, and the tillage. The beyond is just the opposite of the SUs. SU, SUs break down rapidly in low pH. Beyond the imidazolones, beyond the pursuit, they, broke down, they break down very slowly in low pH. Even if you have a tremendous amount of water that comes out of the sky, you're hurting. The guys up around uh, Okanagan, Mansfield, up in that area, you guys don't get a lot of water, but you typically have a pretty high pH, so you guys might be in a little bit better shape than the guy on Moscow Mountain. So um, the field bias, say, I guess that's another way you can look at this. Where, where do you farm? Uh, north of Elmira. North of Elmira, okay. How many years has it been since you put your Beyond on? One. One. <laughs> not so good. Um, you would not want to roll in there with a Roundup Ready, uh, you know, a non Clearfield spring. Kemp Fallow with the winter canola, most cases I would say no. Um, what's your pH in the first couple inches? Six, six and a half. So maybe in the first couple inches, it might be a little bit higher. That one, uh, a non, uh, a non GMO, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Flat out, wouldn't do it. It's going to be bad. You may or may not be okay with an SU residue tolerant one. But what I would do there is I would get some soil, I would put it in a bucket, and see what will grow. That would be my best guess on it. You're kind of in that gray zone right there. But you got to get more than the first crop year away. You got to get out there at least a year out before you even think about it. Or else, plant it. if you want to grow canola, grow the Oasis or the Clearwater, which have the Clearfield gene in them. But which you're, talking, is, huh? you're talking winter canola though, right? Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I, there currently isn't a winter Clearfield canola, is there? There, there is. is there? There's one, but we did, uh, we did, ex I'll, I'll address the go for it. Uh, there are two Clearfield winners. Uh, Claremore is one. In Rubisco seed, if you talk to Brian Colbeck here, they, they have a winter clear field. I don't know how much seed's available, but those are two that I know of. Right. And we, I did see some last year where guys did go in. They did go in uh, after one year or beyond in a higher pH. They had good moisture, and they did just fine with the Roundup Ready SU residue tolerant, but technically we can't make that recommendation. Sir. On, on that, before you get to there, I had a f grower that had a field, oh, it must have been five years ago, and it was a pursuit field, so you're talking the same chemistry as the beyond, and one side had been out eight years, so they planted a Roundup Ready canola on it. The other one had been out, I want to say, four or five years, and I told them they weren't out far enough, so they planted a Clearfield canola on it. If they would not have been planted side by side, you'd have never realized that that Roundup Ready canola was damaged eight years out on pursuit. But since they were planted side by side, there was probably five, six hundred pounds of the acre difference in the Roundup Ready side versus the Clearfield side, and that was being on label in a lower pH, pH area. And that was that was spring canola. That was spring canola, yeah. Roundup Ready versus Clearfield, in the in the same side of the field there. Right, and the spring the spring Roundup Readies, there's no SU residue tolerance there, so you're just swinging in the breeze, if you go out and do it. 
You got a question back there? Yeah, I'm just interested in the, in the heat tolerance that we mentioned for the high class 930, that we observed some heat stress tolerance in the trial. And I was wondering, is that separate from just flowering time, the early maturity, and actually withstood the heat that is on the variety? Is that the purpose for breeding selection, or is that just an observation you've you made on that variety? In that? You know, I'm going to let Mark answer that right behind you on the, the heat tolerance on the 930. So, so it's, a, it's, it's maybe I'd say it's a little bit of both, but the, the side is that what particularly we've tried to find and tried to identify is products that have more stability in the, the individual plots where you see that it goes under serious stress, how far they go down there, what the variety grouping when you're picking up the EXPs, when you're looking at new, new selections, how they handle those situations. So it's, it's evaluation, but it isn't actual exact targeting that. The other piece of it is in both of those 955 and 930, they're, they're sisters to each other, but it's, it's about stability. It's the most two stable products that we've seen in the years. If you go to plots from, from here to the PW to North Dakota to, I put them in South Dakota, you put them in different geographies and the stability at where they, they fall is a lot more uniform and that's part of that, uh, that factor of, of heat and it, it's more of a, Somewhat of an observation, but I, I think it's real. I just make the point in Australia we've only started growing the winter the winter lines, which the wouldn't have thought would do too well in our season in the shore. But the winter types that we're playing with, and I'm not sure exactly sure about their history, but they're holding up under some really hot, dry finishes even in Australia, and it's really surprising we've got a good of their long period, so they seem to Yeah, the genetics say doesn't matter who the breeder is everybody is getting better at this and the genetics are better all the way across the board now than where they were 10 years ago as far as the heat tolerance and so i guess in closing roundup ready gmo non-gmo everybody that's in the game currently is producing good products choose what you think is best for your farm know that you have choices you've got uh, the non-gmo and then you've got a couple of different gmos work with what fits in your farm the goal of all this this is a wheat growing region. I don't think that oil seeds will ever become the dominant crop, but the oil seeds have a definite place in the farms that are in this region because it will help you grow better wheat. And uh, when it all comes down to it, we are a wheat producing region. So figure out what is best for your farm. There are a lot of people here, a lot of resources to talk with. Take advantage of that and see what will work in your, your system. Thanks for my end. So I know there's a lot more questions in here, but we've got to remember we're at the Oilseed Conference. So almost everybody that's in this room, whether it be Don or Jim Davis, will be here the rest of the conference to ask questions of. So if you don't find your answer one place, keep talking to everybody. So I appreciate everybody being here. I think we're out of time. So I guess Bo, Bo could probably talk all the way through lunch. You know, so he was trying to talk through every single slide we had. So anyhow. Thank you all for coming. Lunch there is. Let's give these two gentlemen a hand. A great job. <laughs>